Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Reality Check with Jess. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I wanted to give you guys an update on what is happening with the new IDR plan, the Income Driven Payment Plan, now named SAVE, S-A-V-E, the SAVE plan, uh, that is now going to be offered in 2024. So SAVE stands for Saving on a Valuable Education. What it's going to do is it's going to replace the repayee, which is the revised pay-as-you-earn and the way it's going to work is that if you were already on a repayee plan, you were automatically going to be switched over to the save plan once it rolls out in 2024. And then if you're not on the repayee, you can choose it now and then be switched over when that happens. Or you can choose to save plan once it rolls out. I'm going to go over the main things um, that are really different about the save plan and really what you need to know about it and how it could possibly affect you. Uh, something that's interesting that I want you to keep in mind is that the IDR waiver, which is also uh, known as the IDR account adjustment, that is a separate thing where the education department is essentially correcting uh, the payment counts on everyone's account and also now giving credit for other time that perhaps uh, people weren't getting credit for before and where servicers were not accurately uh, maintaining the proper records and accounts of how many payments you had made towards that IDR forgiveness. So they are now rolling that out. And what they're doing is I spoke about this in my other videos. So I'm just going to make it quick in a recap. Um, they are notifying people who have reached a point of forgiveness under IDR. So whether they have um, the 20 years or 25 years, depending on their payment plan uh, of payments. And so they're notifying people now whether or not they have loans that um are eligible for forgiveness and will be forgiven. And then they'll be letting people know every two months uh, until next year, where if you haven't reached a point of forgiveness, like let's say you're shy of those 20 years or 25 years, then what they're going to do is just update your payment count online. And if you want to take advantage of that IDR account adjustment, uh, because what it's going to do too is it's going to give you credit. Um, if you consolidate, let's say you have an FFELP loan or something of that, uh, if you consolidate it to be held by the Department of Education uh, into a direct loan, then you will not lose any of your prior payments and it will give you credit for all of your prior payments. That is what they are saying. But the consolidation would have to be done by December 2023. And when I say done by December 2023, I mean that it has to be completed, not you apply, not it's in process. It has to already be done and completed. And that can take about three months. So if that's something you're interested in, you would want to do that no later than I would say like September 1st, um, just to be on the safe side because it can take time. There can be hiccups, things can get lost. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't wait to the last minute if that's something you are thinking about. Now, with the new changes, once they go into to play, um, then if you did consolidate later, uh, this is after the safe plan goes into effect, not that middle point between the IDR account adjustment being rolled out and the um, the safe plan coming into play, because there could be potentially six month difference in that, depending on how things go, right? You know, things change all the time. Um, so if that happens, potentially you could end up just then losing all of your payment history if it's not done by then. But if you end up consolidating once the safe plan is, uh, is essentially rolled out and live, then you would actually get a weighted average of your payments. And I'll go into that because we'll talk about that. So I didn't want to go too deep, but I just wanted to let people know, um, because in case there are some people who have not consolidated for whatever reason, um, which, you know, at this point, I mean, it, the, the main thing would be so that you can get that forgiveness. Uh, otherwise, it would have probably been helpful before because of the pandemic uh, 0% uh, interest rate. So, and also that time being counted towards forgiveness. So here's the thing with the safe plan. What they're saying is that the safe plan is going to reduce the amount that everyone has to pay for, for most people, essentially, because what they're doing is they're saying they're increasing the income exemption from 150% to 225% of the poverty line. And they give some examples 
Um, so they're saying if you are a single person earning uh, less than $32,800 or a family of four and you earn six hundred or $67,500 or less, um, then you'll have a $0 payment. And when you have a $0 payment, the difference is now is that you're not going to have the interest accruing on there. It's going to count as if you made a full payment because right now um, the the problem with, with a lot of these student loans is that you can have a payment. Let's say, all right, your payment is $150 a month. And that's what they tell you your payment is. You're making your payment of $150 a month, but it doesn't actually... Um, it doesn't actually cover the principal and the interest. So what they're doing is even though you're not late, they're not telling you it's not covering that. And so they're taking that extra amount that, that would be needed to cover that and then adding it onto your principal. So they give an example here. So what they're saying is that the plan eliminates 100% of remaining interest for both subsidized and unsubsidized loans after a scheduled payment is made under the SAVE plan. So if you make your monthly payment, your loan balance won't grow to, due to unpaid interest. And they gave the example here, very similar to mine, where it says if $50 in interest accumulates each month and you have a $30 payment, the remaining $20 would not be charged. Normally, you know, even if your payment was only 30 bucks, they're still putting that extra 20 on there. And you're like, well, I made my payment. How is my balance growing? So what it's attempting to do is stop balances from growing as long as you're making the payment. It's also going to stop you from uh, having to put your spouse's income information and and sign your IDR application if you're under repayee, which will now be saved, um, even if you're uh, if you're married filing separately. Because right now, if you're married filing separately, even if you're not filing taxes together, they still make your spouse sign that form and give their income information especially if you're doing it online. When you're doing it online, everything's automated. If you have a unique situation, let's say your income has changed or your spouse is like, I don't wanna sign this or I don't wanna be involved, then just print out the paper application uh, and save yourself the trouble. Because if you print out the paper application, you can fax it to them um, or you can mail it. I would just say fax, it's a lot easier, it's quicker. Um, and then you can do that and say that you don't have access to your spouse's income information and then they would only count yours. So if you have that sort of situation, there is a way to still uh, get around that in terms of being able to be in an IDR plan. Uh, even if you are married filing jointly and let's say, like I said, your income has changed or you're not giving your, your tax information. That's another thing too, when you're applying for these plans online, um, they essentially, the only way that you can sign up for an IDR online is if you allow them to use your, uh, income tax information, right? So your 1040 information, not everybody wants them to have that. Some people are like, Hey, I'd rather just give you my pay stubs. I'm not trying to give you my, my tax return. That's a little too much, um, of you guys having unfettered access to my entire family's situation, right? And, and everything else. So that's perfectly fine as well. Um, you are able to do that. You just would have to print out the application. Um, so this is just going over what I had already said, uh, that if you're in repayee, they are going to automatically put you in save when it becomes available. The new application for the save plan will be available in the summer, um, next summer, meaning 2024. And they'll notify people when it's um, available. And then if you apply for an IDR plan now and select a repayee, you'll automatically be put into save once it becomes available. Um, and then you can also select the option for your loan servicer to place you on the lowest monthly payment. So it doesn't have to be repayee. Now, I would personally not necessarily automatically do that. <laughs> I would look at what all the terms are because all these different um, IDR plans, they have different terms uh, in terms of how long you have to pay. Some are, you know, 20 years, some are 25 years if you have graduate loans and some are 20 years just regardless. Uh, pretty much everyone can qualify for the repayee. Not everyone can qualify for everything else. Um, so just make sure you're taking a look at that and see what fits your situation best. Um, so um, you can go to studentaid.gov and take a look and see what IDR plan you're on. Uh, this is giving an example of what the uh, monthly payments would be for 
uh, the save plan. So it's showing like a family of three. If you make um, $50,000 or under, your payment would be $0 and that would count as a full payment. Um, and then it's given an example of, you know, your payment would be $34. So that is what they are doing there. Uh, let me go down here. So one of the things too, uh, that they are doing. Oh, let me not go over this for sure. Because if you have graduate and undergraduate loans, you're going to end up paying a weighted average of between five and 10% of your income based on the original principal balances of your loans. So if you have graduate loans, then it's not going to just be that 5%. And it's not going to be that, oh, well, my undergrad is 5% and then my grad is this other, you know, 10%. They are going to make a weighted average across the line. So if you have graduate loans, you are not going to be paying 5%. So when you're looking at uh, these charts, keep that in mind because they're not really giving all that full information. Uh, they're just, when they're talking about the loans, they're talking about undergraduate loans. They are not talking about grad school loans. So keep that in mind. That only applies to undergrad loans. And if you have graduate student loans, then it will change. Okay. And it will be a weighted average if you have both. If you don't have both, I believe it will be 10% still. So if you don't have both, meaning if you only have graduate loans, it will be 10%. So that chart would not be the same for you. Um, so another update, they say they're going to have a new integration with the IRS to access financial information. So it says when you apply or recertify your IDR plan, you'll be able to provide approval, they say, for the secure disclosure of tax information so they can automatically access your latest tax return. And they're saying that'll save you time because you don't have to manually provide any income or family size information. Uh, for your initial application or recertification. And then it's also going to allow you to do an automatic recertification. So it'll just automatically do it for you every year. Some people are okay with that. They're fine. They're like, oh, great. That's easy. Um, others aren't. And it's okay to not be. It's okay to say, yeah, no, you're not going to automatically uh, get my IRS tax return every year. I'll, I'll give you what I'm okay with giving you, whether it be my tax return or my pay stubs. And also because your family size can change, things can change, your income can change. And please keep that in mind. If you were making $100,000 when you last filed your taxes, and now you're making 32,000, don't have them go off of your tax return. Submit your new pay stubs so that you can show your new current income, right? Um. And so let's see, they're also saying the end of the interest capitalization when a borrower leaves most IDR plans. So they're saying as of July 1st, unpaid interest on your loans won't be added when you leave any IDR plan, except the income-based repayment plan, the IBR, where capitalization is required by statute. So if you leave an IBR plan, then your interest will be capitalized, meaning all the outstanding interest is now added to the principal. And that does make, that is significant because now your interest rate, right, is based on that larger principal. So let's say your principal was 5,000 and you had $2,000 outstanding interest. Well, now it's going to basically be $7,000 principal that all the interest is based off of. So they're also saying that it's going to be a new application that it should, you know, you should be able to enroll in 10 minutes or less and uh, track your application on studentaid.gov. Um, let's see. So they're just going over really the same thing. Oh, this one too, that's really big because, you know, people have had questions about this. So borrowers with original principal balances of $12,000 or less will receive forgiveness of any remaining balance after making 10 years of payments with the maximum repayment period before forgiveness rising by one year for every $1,000 borrowed. For example, if your original principal balance is $14,000, you will see forgiveness after 12 years because it's Another year, one year for 13,000 and two years for 14,000. So, you know, a thousand after each of the 12. And payments made previously before 2024 and those made going forward will, will both count toward these forgiveness, uh, these maximum forgiveness timeframes. Now, keep this in mind. 
they're saying original principal balances of $12,000 or less, you know, being forgiven after 10 years of payments. They are talking about your total balances, right? So essentially, if honestly, this is really not going to impact most people, in my opinion, I'm just being honest here, right? Most people had more than $12,000 of payments. Uh, even if people went to a community college because maybe you needed money to live off of things like that. So, um, and, and just, it's not always cheap, I, you know? So, um, you know, $12,000 $12, is still a lot of money, but you guys understand what I'm saying. So just think about that because the way they were talking about it at first was like, oh, well, if we're going per loan, then if I have, you know, five different loans, for undergrad or for grad, for undergrad and grad school, then that means the ones that were under $12,000, I should be able to, you know, have those at least start falling off after 10 years of payments. And that's not how it's working. It is your total principal balance that you have if it's $12,000 or less. Um, then they're also changing it so that, and we we're talking about consolidation earlier, borrowers who consolidate will not lose progress toward forgiveness. They will receive credit for a weighted average of payments that count toward forgiveness based on the principal balance of the loans being consolidated. Now, that is important because that is different from what is being offered right now with the IDR account adjustment or IDR waiver. With the IDR waiver, all of the payments are supposed to be counted. Now, what they're saying with this is that it's going to be a weighted average. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to work out for some people um, because before what they were saying is essentially if you if you were to, to consolidate right now, remember for consolidation, um, depending on, on what you have going on, you're, you're essentially just moving some things over. Um, like if you had an FFELP now for others, they have to, um, you know, they're consolidating various direct loans. Um, I don't know. Everybody's like I said, everybody's situation is different for me personally. Um, I would think long and hard about, whether or not consolidating multiple direct loans is going to be any benefit for you. I would think about that because sometimes it, it, it really may not if it's multiple direct loans. I'm not talking about bringing a program, bringing a loan over to the direct loan program. Um, but if it's multiple direct loans, it may not. The only thing is maybe because of your um, on your credit report, you'll have less loans reporting. Um, and then, I mean, because typically even, you know, with this, now that it's going to just, the payments are going to just be based off of your income, um, it, it depending, like I said, it really depends on your situation. If you're at a zero payment, it's, mm, I don't, I don't see what benefit you'd really get from that because you wouldn't want a weighted average for something that is, you know, going to be forgiven quicker, but it depends. Is that balance higher? Is it lower? Would that weighted average help you? If you're like, oh, well, this is my loan that's only 5,000 and I have 30,000 over here, but if I can buy them, now it's going to make me, now it's going to allow me to pay off that 30,000 a lot quicker or get forgiveness a lot quicker. That's something that could work out with you versus if it's the opposite. If your $30,000 loan is the older loan that's like nine years old or 15 years old or something like that. And then you have a $2,000 loan that's only a year old. Uh, it's really not going to help you to combine those loans more than likely, right? Because now what you're doing is you're extending the time you have to pay that $30,000 loan. So again, everybody's situation is different. You have to think about what works for you. You know, for me, I'm not giving financial advice on this because everybody's situation is different. There's so many nuances. So that's why I just want to give you uh, the best information that I can based on what they have provided here. So borrowers will, borrowers will automatically receive credit toward forgiveness for certain periods of deferment and forbearance, and borrowers will be given the option to make additional catch-up payments to get credit for all other periods of deferment or forbearance. I think that's a big deal um, just because it may say, okay, well, this is now going to shave off, you know, um, uh, you know, 
three years off of my my loan in terms of bringing me closer to forgiveness. So that could be very helpful, depending on what those catch-up payments are, obviously. And then it says borrowers who are 75 days late will be automatically enrolled in IDR if they have agreed to allow the Department of Education to securely access their tax information. Um, so yeah, that's really that's really the the big thing. Um, if you have a zero dollar payment, you obviously you don't have to pay anything that month. Just make sure you know your recertification date. Um, Let's see. Oh, they also said if you have additional money in your budget to pay down your student loan balance, you can always set a custom payment amount each month, even if you have a zero dollar payment. And then also um, it says if I apply for Safe Plan this summer, will my application be processed before I have to start making payments in October? Because remember, even though right now uh, payments are going to be required for federal student loans after the Supreme Court struck down that ten dollars to $20,000 forgiveness plan. They are not going to be reporting any late payments or anything um, or doing any collections until the end of next year. So until a year from now. So that's why they're saying before I have to start making payments in October. And it says, yes, if you apply for an IDR plan, such so as a save plan this summer, your application will be processed in time for your first payment due date, and it may take your servicer a few weeks to process your request because they will need to obtain documentation of your income and family size. Now, if you are able to make payments, um, I it wouldn't be in your best interest necessarily to wait until October, even though you know that it's not going to be reported as late, um, just because you're not going to get any credit for that time unless you're going to have a zero dollar payment. Right. Um, if you're going to have a zero dollar payment, then and, and you feel like your income is possibly going to stay the same, then you don't lose. You probably don't lose much by having that extra year on there. Uh, but that's really it, guys. Sorry, I know this one's a little bit long, but I wanted to make sure that I'm going over this in detail for you guys so that you have an idea of what is going on and you can make the best decision that works for your situation. So thank you so much for tuning in and, you know, as more information comes out, I'll definitely follow up and, and do the best I can to kind of go over this for you. Please make sure you like and subscribe. Also share this video with others because I think it will be very, very helpful for them to understand, especially just going over um, what's on the website piece by piece. And I also have my cash up in the corner to our blessed if you are able and willing uh, to donate. So thank you so much, guys, and I will speak to you on the next one.